if the human race is to continue for another million years, we will have to boldly go where no one has gone before. This is just one eon, one stage of a perhaps infinite succession of eons, one after the other.十年，我们的想象在光年之外。十年，我们的血液超越光年。这里距离地球已有四十六亿光年。飞鱼星座南部的SMACS零七二三星系团第一次以如此清晰的方式呈现，这是詹姆斯·韦伯太空望远镜献
Then we unfold the sunshade uh, panels and uh, then eventually stretch out the uh, sunshade into its shape. Um, and we cool off the telescope by separating it from the spacecraft. Unroll the covers over the sunshade. And this looks extremely complicated, and it is. So we had to invent 10 new kinds of technology to make this work. We had to learn how to make the mirrors. We had to learn how to focus the telescope after launch. We had to learn how to make this unfolding sunshade out of pieces of plastic. And we didn't know any of this when we started, but we do now. So if you want to have another telescope that's even more powerful than this, we will be able to build the next one also. So the final step is unfolding the telescope into its right shape. It's still not quite ready for operation because at this point it's still warm and has not been focused yet. It took altogether six months to get the telescope ready for scientific operations, which began in July of 2022. We have four major scientific reasons for wanting to fly the telescope. First one is, uh, what happened after the Big Bang? There were no luminous objects in that Big Bang material that I showed you, uh, but there are stars and galaxies exist now, so when did that happen? Uh, astronomers call this the cosmic dark ages that we must investigate. So that's the first question. Second question is, how do the galaxies grow? The Milky Way th that we live in is 100 billion stars or orbiting around a common center held together by gravity. So how did that happen? We think the Milky Way was formed from thousands of smaller pieces being pulled together by gravity. Well, is that true? We can tell by looking at galaxies much farther back in time to see what they were like when they were young. How about stars? Stars are being born today. Uh, how does that work? We can't see very well because it always happens inside dusty clouds of gas, which are opaque for the telescopes. But infrared light can penetrate much better through dust clouds and show us the stars being born as we speak. Finally, what about planets? We know um, th that now that most stars have planets, most stars have many planets. But so far we have not found any systems that are very much like the solar system with four rocky planets in the middle and four gaseous giant planets outside. So very mysterious. Are there places that could be like Earth with an atmosphere and conditions that could support life? We do not know. So here is our first picture that we released to the public on July 11th, 2022. What we see in this picture are many thousands of galaxies. The space in this uh, picture is about as big as the grain of sand held at arm's length. Very tiny piece of sky, so if you imagine this kind of image covering the entire sky, there would be trillions and trillions of galaxies. So in the picture you see little fuzzy things. Those are actually pretty close galaxies. And there are also tiny, tiny specks, and those are the most distant ones. We're looking to find the history of our galaxies from studying pictures like this. In the middle, you see a big fuzzy blue thing, and that is a cluster of very new galaxies close by, only about four billion light years away. They are so massive and they have so much gravity that they can bend light that's passing nearby. Einstein told us that gravity can bend light, and sure enough, it does. We see the direct evidence right here. Some of the galaxies have been distorted into curves. Some of them have been distorted into strange object shapes. And so we use these extra lenses for our telescope that nature has given us to study the even more distant universe. So there are thousands of galaxies in here and we wanted to know more about them. In this picture, we found two little arcs that seem to be magnified images of a distant galaxy. And we saw that they have the same spectrum, which means they're two images of the same object. The spectrum is basically spread out the light of the galaxy into the rainbow of colors. And the uh, different colors correspond to different uh, molecules or atoms that are in the galaxy way out there. So we see this pattern and we see it's the same in both images. So yes, we confirm that there are really two images of one object. We are also able to get more detail about the very faintest objects. This is the best we can do so far to looking back for the very first objects find the very faintest, reddest objects you can in that picture and then examine them and get a spectrum of each one. Again, spread out the light into the colors and see what are the chemical elements that are in there. 
So we found one in this picture, which is uh, basically the universe as it was 13.1 billion years ago, only 700 million years after the expansion began. So we're able to look at it. We see the chemicals in it are hydrogen and oxygen, which uh, is great. Uh, we expect that. But you know, oxygen was not there in the Big Bang material. So this already, no matter how far we've looked so far, we have not yet seen any galaxies that are primordial. They're made out of only the hydrogen and helium of the Big Bang. We can look in more detail to see what else is in those galaxies. So this particular one also has um, neon, and as well as other chemical elements. This one's just showing neon as well as the oxygen and hydrogen. Um, this is just the beginning of chemical analysis of distant galaxies. We have taken a picture of a much closer object. This is a collection of five galaxies called Stefan's Quintet. Uh, Stefan's Quintet actually is four galaxies interacting with each other and one galaxy that's much closer. The one on the left is much closer to us and we can see individual red stars in that image. The two in the middle are colliding and merging together right now. And there's a cloud of red material around the galaxies where new stars are being born from the gas that's being compressed in the collision. The top galaxy in this picture actually has a black hole in the middle that we can see. Uh, so what's a black hole? A black hole is a place where the gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can get out again. So, of course, how do we know that it's there? Well, we see things that are falling in. Uh, when material falls in towards the black hole, it gets compressed and heated to immense temperatures, hundreds of thousands of degrees in there and so we see that and we want to analyze that process. So you know, we are able to do that as well. Here we have a, a, another way of spreading out the light. Uh, we can get a spectrum of each piece of the image and say well where are the hydrogen iron atoms? Where are the molecular hydrogen molecules? Where are the atomic hydrogen molecules? And each has a different shape. So we're beginning to learn how do the uh, black holes work by pulling material in and how do things orbit around the black hole. Even uh, longer wavelengths we can study, we see near the black hole there are sand grains. We call them the silicates in astronomy. Uh, this is uh, material that's like um, the sand on the beach, uh, but a different as well. We, this is important for astronomers because this is a kind of place where new stars can be born inside these sandy, dusty, cloudy regions. So it's right there next to the, to the black hole and we'd like to know how this all works. Close to home, we have another beautiful picture. This is a, a, a demonstration that once in a while galaxies do collide. In this case, a, a galaxy, small galaxy, made a direct hit in the middle of the bigger galaxy. And what we see is the splash of material flying away from the center and forming new stars uh, that we see in those reddish, bluish ring around the center. It's beautiful to look at, and for a scientist, we want to know how does this work? Here is a, a, a remarkable example of image processing. Uh, this uh, galaxy doesn't look at all like this when we take the picture with the Hubble telescope, but uh, this now looks like a slice through a sponge. You see huge holes in the galaxy, and those holes come because bright stars can push the material away. The light that comes from the stars is, has got pressure. It pushes things and it heats things. So now we can see the result of having bright stars making holes in the galaxy. And so it's beautiful to look at, and we have to someday understand how this works. This is the close example. Uh, this is called the Carina Nebula. This is a place where stars are being born inside that cloud, and some of them have already come out. The top half of the picture is filled with bright stars, the blue ones and yellow ones. The stars, by the way, are the ones with the, uh, the hexagonal pattern of spikes sticking out. Um, that's what we see on the very bright stars. They are so bright that they can evaporate the surface of the dust cloud, and you see these wispy blue columns of material coming up from the dust cloud. Inside the cloud are hundreds of new stars, and of course we want to see how that works. We believe each one of those may have its own disk uh, orbiting around it with planets growing, so this is a place for us to learn about star formation with planets. We can also see what happens when a star is old. Uh, very many times a star will explode in a, in a violent kind of explosion. Uh, that's called a supernova or a nova. This is the more uh, peaceful kind. This is a uh, star that uh, produces a thing that looks like a planet but is actually not. 
It is a cloud of material that was expelled from a star, similar to the sun. When the sun gets old, the sun may also do this. So again, it's beautiful for us. We need to understand how it works inside. And the right-hand side picture, you can see there are two stars. Uh, the one on the left is the one that's sending out material. The one on the right is going to do it also in some time in the future. Here we have Jupiter. Jupiter, of course, is a king of the planets, as we call it. Uh, we are interested in how it works. It has a permanent storm called the red spot, and you can see it's still there in the infrared picture. It has fascinating satellites orbiting around it as well. Europa is especially interesting to us because we know a lot about it, and it's a sh I'll show it to you in the next picture. This is Europa as it was observed by the Galileo mission. Uh, the Galileo mission took pictures to see that the surface is actually covered with ice. Uh, and the ice blocks have cracks between them. There is brown material coming up from the ocean underneath. Uh, we would love to know what's in that brown material and whether that ocean has organic material in it. So we are planning to send a uh, NASA probe out there to fly through the plumes of water vapor coming out to see are there organic molecules. We will be watching it as we did with the Hubble Space Telescope to see what are the contents of those water jets and when to go look for them. We'll also be looking at Titan, which is a satellite of Saturn, which is so large that it has an atmosphere of its own and a big enough atmosphere to support a helicopter, which we'll be using to explore the surface of Saturn. We'll be watching Saturn and Titan with the Webb Telescope. We'll even be looking out as far as Pluto to see the changes of the weather all the way out at Pluto. And we'll be looking at stars that have planets that we can tell from a distance. Uh, this, there are two ways to see them. One is to take a picture, and one is to wait for a planet to go in front of its star and block some starlight. When the planet blocks some starlight, you can say, oh, now I know the planet is there. I know how the big the planet is relative to the size of the star. And I now can also say, well, what about the light from the star that goes through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to the telescope? You can analyze that and look to see if there are any signs of molecules or haze or clouds or any other features in the atmosphere of a planet around another star. So we've already done this uh, with the web and we've taken one picture uh, this way to prove that the technique works. Uh, we knew that there would be this pattern and it sure enough is. Uh, the pattern shows uh, water vapor in the atmosphere of a very large planet about as big as Jupiter or being very close to a star that's very much like the sun. So we proved the technique works, and now we're going to be using to the same method to examine small planets around small stars where there's a chance to find out if they are like Earth orbiting another little star. So not right yet, but soon this year, we will be able to tell you, are there planets that have an atmosphere that are the size of Earth? So all astronomers can participate in our work uh, wherever you are, you can get the data from the archive. Uh, if you want to observe with the Webb Telescope, you can send us a proposal. The proposals will be due in January of 2023. And there are instructions online with uh, videos of explaining how to write proposals. And when you send the proposal in and we read it, we will not know where you are or who you are because we have a process called Dual Anonymous. Uh, so you can send us a proposal from anywhere. And if it's a good idea, but we might choose you, and uh, then we'll send you the data. So we invite the entire public, all astronomers, to participate in analyzing the images and the data that we get back from the Webb Telescope. We have our presence on the social media and, of course, on the Internet, and we welcome you to follow us and ask us questions.